Tehran. Perhaps the youngest of Iran's many historic cities, it has been the national capital for more than 200 years. A remarkable feat in and of itself, considering how rapidly Iran or Persia used to change its capital. So are you ready to find out how Tehran went from being an ordinary town to one of the largest cities in the world by population? The origins of Tehran cannot be covered without mentioning Rey, a crucial ancient city situated on the Silk Road, which served as a capital for the Parthian and the Seljuk empires, and was also the hometown of one of the greatest medieval scientists, Al-Razi. Long before Tehran became a fully-fledged city that earned the imperial attention of the Shah, it was a village north of Rey, and it is first mentioned in historical accounts in the 11th century. Tehran's opportunity to step out of the shadows of its nearby metropolitan neighbour Rey came in the shape of the Mongol invasion, which brought untold death and destruction to Persia. Rey, a city that had flourished for over a millennium, was razed to the ground, and a massacre of its inhabitants ensued. Those who could escape soon found their way to Tehran, swelling the population of the erstwhile village, which would soon become a town that was interestingly enough renowned for its pomegranates. By the beginning of the 15th century, it was a large town that was still without walls, a key distinction of prestige and importance in this period. Tehran's metamorphosis from a small village to a city was completed in the mid-16th century by the Safavid Shah Tahmasp, the same one who offered the second Mughal Emperor Humayun sanctuary after the latter was kicked out of India. Shah Tahmasp built a town wall and a bazaar. In time, more buildings would be added by the Safavids later. The Safavid period helped Tehran become a trading hub that could act as a regional center. Now we have to fast forward a couple of centuries before Tehran enters into prominence again. Unfortunately for Persia, the 18th century was a time of serious upheaval for the country with power changing hands several times between the Safavids, the Pashtun Afghans, Nadir Shah Afshar, the Zands, and finally the Qajars. Towards the end of the century, Agha Muhammad Khan, the founder of the Qajar dynasty, who by the way couldn't grow a beard because he had been castrated before he had reached puberty. Anyway, he established a semblance of unity when he brutally asserted his own authority across the country. Tehran was made the capital of Qajar Persia in 1794, a strange choice considering it was a city with no history as an imperial centre. But this was actually one of the main reasons Agha Muhammad Khan preferred it to say Esfahan or Shiraz, because those cities would have had elites that were loyal to previous rulers. Tehran was also close to the Qajar homeland in the north of the country. The city's newfound imperial prestige led to a rise in its population, with people emigrating in the hope of taking advantage of the prospect of a better standard of living in the capital. Whilst Tehran certainly grew in subsequent decades, with a walled citadel and a major bazaar, the 19th century is also a relatively miserable time for the Persians, largely thanks to being caught in something known as the Great Game. This might ring a bell to those of you who are familiar with Afghan history, because this was a period of competition in the 19th century between the British and the Russian empires, mainly over Persia and Afghanistan. With Russian conquests of the former Persian territories of Georgia, Armenia and the Caucasus Emirates, as well as the Central Asian Khanates, this effectively meant that the Russian Empire was separated from British-held India by Afghanistan and Persia. For British imperial officials, this was the stuff of nightmares. Because India was a tremendous cash cow that was absolutely pivotal to their entire imperial project. The reason all of this is important to Tehran is that similar to the rest of the Islamic world in this period, the Persian authorities were aware that they were suffering at the hands of the technologically superior Europeans and that the only way to defend themselves would be to adopt the strategies that got the Europeans to where they were, namely, modernization. 
As modernization was put into practice and the process of urbanization occurred, this gave an increasingly naked and more obvious expression to the social stratification that was happening not only in Tehran but throughout Persian society, whereby the gap between different classes was widening more and more. And so, Iran's turbulent 20th century can be better understood if we look into the 19th century first. Now, at the beginning of the 20th century, 1905 to 1911 to be exact, Persia was the scene of a constitutional revolution that was spearheaded by a wide consensus of mullahs, workers, liberal reformers, merchants and students who had had enough of the Qajar Shah's inability to bring change which could satisfy the public. Places like Tehran and Tabriz were major centers of this effort to replace arbitrary rule, meaning the choice and whim of an individual, with the rule of law that could be dictated by a written constitution and would need the consultation of something akin to a parliament. But the revolution had inherited an economy that was rotten in its foundation and the task of leading Persia into another golden period was given to what would become the last Persian imperial dynasty, the Pahlavi dynasty, founded by Reza Shah Pahlavi. Whilst Reza Shah was not interested in constitutionalism and ruled like a king, he was firmly entrenched in the post-World War I modernist ideas that were also represented by Ataturk in Turkey and Amanullah in Afghanistan. In some way, he can be regarded as the father of modern Iran. He was the one who officially changed the country's name to Iran in 1935. Tehran benefited greatly from the modernization as it was essentially rebuilt to meet modern standards. In the process, the old had to be replaced with the new and the old city walls were pulled down and wide streets built to make it easier for the transport of goods, something which would have gone hand in hand with the overall focus on industrialization as well. And fortunately, beautiful historical monuments like the Tekya Daulat had to be removed and make way for modern buildings that were strangely enough influenced by ancient aka pre-Islamic Persian architecture like the National Bank. It was during Reza Shah's reign that Tehran shook off much of its traditional character and assumed a much more modern identity that was shaped by modernist patterns of planning. Just when it seemed like Iran could regain some of its lost luster of glory, international politics intervened and Reza Shah's hopes for Tehran were dashed by the onset of World War II. In the years leading up to the war, Iran, like many Muslim countries, had built good relations with the Germans because it didn't have a pronounced imperial history whilst the region was severely distrustful of France and Britain which had already colonized large portions of the wider Middle East. Whilst Iran had announced its neutrality early on, its strategic importance in relation to British oil interests as well as potentially serving as a supply line to the Soviets known as the Persian Corridor, resulted in the joint invasion and occupation of Iran by Britain and the Soviet Union. Reza Shah was forced to abdicate and his dreams for a modern Iran left unfulfilled. In 1943, in the midst of World War II, the big three, leaders of Britain, America and Soviet Union, Winston Churchill, Franklin Roosevelt, and Joseph Stalin all met in Tehran and determined that Nazi Europe would be invaded by the Allies from the West, later culminating in the D-Day landings in France 1944. Reza Shah was replaced by his son Mohammad Reza Shah who was in favour of modernization just like his father. As a result of his policies, especially in the 1960s and 70s, Tehran grew incredibly, so much so that by the eve of the Iranian revolution in 1979, the city's population consisted of 4 million, whereas at the start of the century, it would have been a couple of hundred thousand. Tehran was a metropolis in the making. New highways, large satellite towns, and high-rise buildings like the Azadi Tower pointed to a prosperous future. But whilst Iran was going through the best chapter of its history for the last few centuries, the socio-economic divide was widening and the Shah's secret police were getting out of hand. In 1979, the Iranian monarchy was toppled and replaced with an Islamic republic ruled by Ayatollah Khomeini. Soon after, 
The deadly Iran-Iraq war from 1980 to 1988 seriously hampered the development of Tehran and the rest of the country. Since then, Tehran has bounced back thanks largely to the enigmatic mayor Ghulam Hussein Karbashi, who in the 1990s solved the city's overcrowding issue, which is said to have been so bad that at one point the Iranian government even considered choosing a new capital. Thank you guys for watching and listening. Make sure to like, comment and subscribe. And a special thank you goes out to all of our patrons that continue to support Hikmah History financially. Until next time, peace.